What is up, Bat family? Welcome to a bonus The Batman video. And in today's video, we're doing something I haven't really done before, and that is me commentating over what Matt Reeves has to say about the Arkham interrogation scene. But more interestingly, just going over his concept, his backstory for this Joker, and overall, why I wanted to do this is because after talking about Joker for some time, where there's different opinions out there, some people are like, I really don't like this direction for Joker. I hate his design. Why is he already in Arkham at this point? Why isn't he even called Joker right now? Or what, what even is this concept? Some people are like, okay, I do like the direction. So no matter what side you're on, I love hearing Matt Reeves ramble about it. I'm kind of low-key hoping that even though this has been out for a while, that some of you might not actually have had this insight from the director of the Batman himself talking about Joker, the dynamic and relationship between Joker and Batman already by this point. I just think it's fascinating. So I hope you guys enjoy this bonus content here and let me know if you want to see more videos like this. Give it a like if you do enjoy it and let's get into what Matt Reeves has to say about his own vision here of the Batman and Joker in his Batverse. I'm mad about you. Want to know my name? Just look inside. Originally, we my had boy. a scene where Batman and seeing that the Riddler was writing to him again um, was very unnerved and he wanted to get into the mindset of uh, the Riddler, who's a serial killer. And so we wanted him to go to Arkham and talk to another serial killer, um, who in the script uh, we called the Unseen Prisoner. Right, I'm gonna pause it right there. I mean, as I said, I'm gonna be doing that quite a bit. I do love this concept, by the way. Batman, once again, getting another letter in the movie from this serial killer who seems to pretend to know quite a bit about Batman. This is why the Arkham scene was originally in the movie. And we're going to get into why it was cut out because a lot of people have responded recently in recent Batman discussion series videos. Why would they cut that out? It makes no sense. We're going to get into that as well. Matt Reeves does talk about it. But I love how Batman is so unnerved now. Batman using his detective skills, since this is a very detective driven Batman, thinks of, okay, well, there is one freak that I can speak to who might be able to understand this from a place that I couldn't necessarily get the insight in, whereas this Joker could. So I, I do love the concept. The, the tee up to this scene, if it was in the movie, would have been seriously cool. I do understand why some people say that. Imagine it, because this isn't like too far into the movie, but it's not too early. It's, you know, after Commissioner Pete Savage dies. So the fact that Batman would have gone to Arkham Asylum that probably would have not blown people's minds, but everyone would have been like, oh, is that Joker like that early on versus that of the ending scene? I do 100% agree that the Arkham interrogation scene or the unseen Arkham prisoner scene is, is kind of better than the ending scene. But anyway, let's continue. And I think for me, what I wanted to do in trying to kind of launch a new year to Gotham was to have it be as if all of these characters that we know in Gotham sort of already exist. And here we have a version of this character. Got to pause again, having a version of that and where all of these characters that we love and know already exist. So does this confirm? I mean, I've always said headcanon wise, does this mean technically Killer Croc is out there? Does this mean technically that Jonathan Crane is working on his fear toxin right now out there? But you just might, again, everything's just like the Batman who's still becoming. We have the Joker who's still becoming. We have the Riddler who is becoming or whom has become in this movie. So you could argue a lot of them are in motion out there. Who is not yet the Joker, but is going to become the Joker. Yeah. And I wanted Batman to have had an experience with him that put him in Arkham. Uh, so something happened in that first year, and they they have a connection right from the beginning. And I wanted this version of the character to go all the way back to the original Bob Kane, Bill Finger mm -hmm. inspiration. So this is why I love Matt Reeves' um, vision for Gotham. And, you know, I'm going to sound like a simp here. I, I basically admit that I am because 
his vision for Batman Gotham, his influences, his research that he applies to this innovative take is all incredibly well thought out. And I know a lot of people somewhat disagree with Joker looking the way he does here. And I've always said without going on a massive tangent here, because it's very easy to do so with this um, subject matter. I think it subverts people's expectations of what they already have locked in as a Joker character. So you might have a chiseled Joker who doesn't necessarily look ugly, but clown looking with a with a long, you know, red killing joke type painted smile. And he's not got, you know, scars and, and scratches and loose bits of hair all over him. So it kind of subverts what you know Joker to be, just as if you saw Batman running around in a completely yellow and pink Batsuit armor, you would be like, that isn't how I know Batman to be. Although I think that's quite a different comparison. But my point is, this doesn't mean that this Joker visual look isn't relevant. It's just a different way to portray him. And Joker, if you've read some of the source material and some of the comics, has had very horrific looks. Matt Reeves also discusses here something happened during Batman Year One that obviously established this relationship and connection between them. We don't know what that is. I wonder what that dance, what that chase was like when Batman was on the Joker's tail and, and of which Matt Reeves even says he hasn't called himself the Joker yet. He hasn't gone on to do that yet, but he will and that we could see that happen during this trilogy which is uh, Conrad Veidt in the silent film, The Man Who Laughs, who, it's like a Phantom of the Opera story, um, and his face is, is locked in a permanent smile because he has this kind of um, degenerative disease. And so what Mike Marino and I talked about was kind of like the Elephant Man, thinking about a character who, you know, there are all these iterations of the Joker. There, of course, is the classic... Uh, version where he fell into a vat of chemicals. There's what Nolan did with uh, the knife scars. And um, we talked about this idea. What I was interested in was this notion that the Joker would have been marked from childhood, the way that all the characters in the story really are kind of marked by events in their childhood. And I love that so much. I know people may still be like, I respect that, but I still don't like what they're doing here with the kind of look of it. I, I get what you're saying, and it goes back to what I was saying. Maybe you have a preferred image of what Batman or Joker should look like. I might even have a preferred image. Like, it might be more Killing Jokey-esque, right? But I still, I think for me, it is what the genetic makeup is of, of the character and how rich and how well thought out it is. It makes me love whatever the, the it could look like. I mean, don't get me wrong. If, if Joker had, like, a 20-foot mohawk, then I'd be like, okay, well, what are you doing with the... Or, like, the damaged tattoo. I'd be like, okay, maybe. But I don't think this is crazy. And, you know, the, the Conrad Veidt, as he says, you know, man who laughs, stuck smile, as per what the original loose inspiration was there but, but behind Joker, and how he's still applying that. This is what I mean by Matt Reeves. I don't think people truly appreciate how much he's actually tried to bring to life here in the Batman in a way that is very true, even if it may not seem like it to some people through maybe perhaps the visual design here. But what I also like is Matt Reeves goes on and on, and I don't know how many people are aware of this and how a lot of this movie is, and their characters, is reflective of the trauma they've experienced. Now, Riddler has his own trauma ever since childhood. Now, we have know that enough throughout the movie, but if you buy the Riddler Year One issues, that gets more and more into his time in the Wayne Manor turned Gotham orphanage. And Joker is no different. Now, yes, some people do prefer the chemical vad. Okay, I'm a guy, killing joke, unreliable flashbacks kind of thing, where I fall into the chemical vad, and, you know, I just come out crazy. You do have more of the somewhat Joker Todd Phillips one, which I'm more in. I prefer the mental health depiction. I do love a good chemical vat, the very comic book fantastical Joker origin. Nothing really tops that in a way. But in more of a grounded realism sense, I do like the one bad day aspect of it. But in real life, if you want to try and ground it even more, it's like a series of bad days, if that makes sense, which is where I think the Joker movie did a really good job. And it's, if you're Joker here with Barry Kilman's degenerative disease, this congenital disease, and you're, you, you know, you're shaped during your childhood, what does that turn you into? And I think that is a really cool concept based off of, you know, the man who laughs and where you, you're stuck with this thing. And I love with what Matt Reeves says next and how it kind of empowered 
the Joker. His case from birth, because he had this, this affliction that was like the Elephant Man, where he um, has this degenerative disease and he has this kind of horrifying smile that's been plastered on his face and he's his whole worldview has been formed by the world looking at him like he was a terrifying freak since he was a child and instead of the sort of legend of john merrick who was supposedly a very soulful beautiful person behind all of the exterior that frightened people here the idea would be that he his exterior would form the interior and that he um, would have a very kind of uh, dark view of humanity and also would be used to people looking at him in a way that he felt that he could start to get inside of their brains. That is amazing. What Matt Reeves just says there, for like trying to do your own Joker thing, I know we haven't seen, like we haven't been thrown in deep with Joker yet to really form a crazy opinion. I mean... For crying out loud, blurred it, Arkham interview screen here, where you can barely see the... Well, you see the smile a bit at the end. And then the end of the movie, where you actually get the scene. He's behind a Arkham cell door. So, yes, we do need to see even more. But Barry Keown's a very, very talented actor in of itself. I have, I have no doubts about his capabilities. And I, I, I love what he does in this, especially the cackle at the end. But what he says there, it's interior. Instead of, like, you know, as he says, the, the legend of uh, the Elephant Man, of whom had this uh, supposed beautiful soul and, you know, as, as as opposed to, like, the exterior that, that frightened people, with Joker, that exterior that horrified people basically influenced the interior person who then, I guess, became and manifested as this horrific clown prince of crime, which he goes on to be. But obviously, by Batman Year One, even when he's not the Joker, he's already done something horrific to obviously be put away as a serial killer. I, I think that is a very, a very, very intelligent and, and awesome, innovative take on the Joker already, just based off concept, like ground-level concept. The sort of legend of John Merrick, who was supposedly a very soulful, we scrolled back a bit. person behind all of the exterior that frightened people. Here, the idea would be that he, his exterior would form the interior and that, that he um, would have a very kind of uh, dark view of humanity and also would be used to people looking at him in a way that he oh, felt that he could start to get inside of their brains to sort of... He's an he sort of has you uh, at his mercy because you're frightened just to look at him, and he's used to that. And um, he has no real um, sort of belief in the goodness of people, but instead has a kind of insidious psychological uh, understanding of the way people respond. And in this... That is so cool. I'm sorry. I'm just going to keep giving Reeves his flowers there just for... just. I think that's so cool because... He's saying that people feel uncomfortable or, you know, feel a certain way if you, and, and have when he was growing up to look at him. But he knows that and he has utilized that because he feels as though he can get in their brains because he knows that, you, you know, you're just, as Matt Reeves says, he kind of has you at his mercy because you're just even frightened to look at him. So imagine having that power over someone that that in of itself adds this intimidation factor that somewhat makes the uh, audience to that person potentially um, vulnerable in a sense. And as Matt Reeves goes on to say that that insidious psychological insight that Joker then gets. And if you use what you felt like was maybe once a weakness, but instead of kind of almost a superpower, I think my favorite line is when he says that, because Barry Keown's Joker is used to that, this insidious psychological understanding of how people work, he's he's managed to gather that perspective and that ability to read people. Even Batman in this scene, as he goes on to do, and this is what it works into the characteristics of what makes Joker the character in per, as per uh, traditionalist canon super intelligent and and. and often genius in certain ways because and how he can get into your head even if you don't think he is you'll then realize you've tripped up over something and where joker already knew that and again is perfectly demonstrated between batman and joker in the end of this scene people but instead has a kind of insidious psychological uh understanding of the way people respond and in this scene the idea was that the joker 
or not yet the Joker, the unseen prisoner, would be enjoying toying with Batman because he sees this connection that actually is one of the key parts of the arc of the whole movie, which is that he um, he knows that they, Batman really sees things very much the same way the Riddler does, and that Batman is unnerved because he knows that he feels that these people in some way deserve what was coming to them, but it's not acceptable for him. So he's pushing this notion away throughout the whole movie. I'm just going to pause it right there. So what he's saying to those who really disagree with why this scene was cut, because it was done quite early on, with what the rest of the movie gives you in terms of information that unfolds naturally up until that of the interrogation scene between Batman and Riddler, you're meant to learn it that way, organically. It's kind of, you know, seeded throughout it. But if you have this scene early on, Joker basically, you know, all the answers are given to you already. And Reeves felt because of that, this is a scene that could kind of be lifted. He really enjoys it. He thinks Barry Keoghan and, and, and Pattinson did a great did great work. But if you have Joker making all of these psychological insights into Batman, as he says, he's toying with Batman because he knows that Batman knows this is something Batman tries to suppress, which I, I think this is what makes this Batman and Joker right here, even though he's not called the Joker just yet. The very dance, beginning dance of their their future dynamic it is plain as day sailing in terms of seeing that vision of where things could go because they've already captured that lightning in a bottle right here, I think, with the writing of this scene. And the way that Barry even plays to like laughing, you know, in this and, and, and Batman's just like, this isn't about me. And it's like, why? You're so much more fun. He's already in Batman's head at this point because he knows that Batman thinks that these people... And this is pretty messed up. <laughs> and as Matt Reeves says, Batman thinks he knows it's not acceptable. These people who Riddler has murdered, Batman kind of thinks... They kind of deserved it, though. Like, I mean, I mean come on. Like, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't kill. I've got my no-kill rule. But they, they kind of deserved it. And he knows that's wrong. And he tries to suppress it. And he's like, doesn't really want to acknowledge it. But when you have... Albeit right now, Batman doesn't really necessarily know that this is his arch enemy that he'll be dancing with for the next two, three, four decades or whatever. But when you have him across the bloody screen of the interrogation room and you have him in your head and you might not realize it yet and you have him who can read you way better than anyone else could because this is Joker reading Batman. I mean, I don't need to explain that one. And he knows that you don't want anyone else to know, let alone you don't want to even confront it in your own mind, that you feel like what Riddler has done is kind of justice in a low-key kind of way. You're not saying that you would kill them, but you, you, you kind of, you basically feel like they deserved it, those horrific deaths. And you have this guy bringing that to the surface, laughing and cackling in your face, yeah, Batman gets up and wants to walk out because the more that Batman shows how Joker is right with everything he's extrapolating and just evaluating that is actually true of what Batman feels in that moment, imagine how pressed you would feel that the Joker, if you're Batman, is just laughing and the more like you're reacting to it, he's laughing more and more and more. And the worst part of all of it is that he's right. He's right. And, you know, that's when it leads into, you think they deserved it, huh? And Joker, this is getting off for him. He, you know, if Batman came in to get help for a case, to get a psychological profile from another serial killer, some insights, and it just turned into be a psychological analyzation profile of what's going on with Batman right now. Tell me how that isn't good, Joker and Batman, in this scene right here. This very, this very discussion I'm having right now with you, in between Reeves talking, is exactly the dynamite I think Reeves has already captured with this character that I just don't think people have quite clicked on. And maybe they just see the makeup and they're like, oh, that's not the pretty looking joke at a time aware. Of. Like, that's what I kind of see other people thinking and they don't see the lightning in the bottle that I believe has already been established with the writing of this scene. But let's scroll back and uh, hear the beginning of that bit again. And in this scene, the idea was that the Joker, or not yet the Joker, the unseen prisoner, would be enjoying toying 
with Batman because he sees this connection that actually is one of the key parts of the arc of the whole movie, which is that he um, he knows that they, Batman really sees things very much the same way the Riddler does, and that Batman is unnerved because he knows that he feels that these people in some way deserve what was coming to them, but it's not acceptable for him. So he's pushing this notion away throughout the whole movie. And when we were putting the movie together, this scene, even though I think that Barry and Rob did such a cool scene together, um, it was one of these things where narratively it wasn't necessary. You got everything that Barry was telling him, that the Joker was telling him over the course of the movie and given the great length of the movie it helped the story to take the scene out but exactly um you know that's one, something i think a lot of people don't realize if they kept this in joker because he's so good kind of gave away the nuances of the movie it's not like there was major bombshells i don't think reeves is trying to say that it's just everything that you should have subtly learned up until when you have the revelation of that uh redler feels like he's being broken up with by Batman at that point, everything's kind of given away already in this deleted scene. It helped the story to take the scene out, but I always really loved the work that Barry and Rob did in the scene. Yeah. And I think one of the fun things to talk about in terms of what Mike Marino and I talked about was I said, you know, I, he, I always wrote it in the script that he would be out of focus and that you'd only see his mouth close at the end. And that's where you would realize that this is some early iteration of the Joker. But Mike only had the out-of-focus space to work with to try and create that Conrad Veidt um, classic sort of s style of image. And so everything he did, he was kind of sketching in the out-of-focus part of the frame. And um, I think he did a beautiful job here. As he did, you know, obviously, Mike also did Colin's makeup for Penguin, and he's, he's really kind of a master. And this is, of course, the key to the whole scene, which is that he does think that they deserve it. <laughs> that, that gives me back to was right there. As Matt Reeves says, that's the whole key to the scene in that he, Batman, does think that they deserve it. And Joker finally confronting him with that and Batman's just wanting to get out there because it's like a flea on his shoulder who's completely right, saying something that you don't even want to admit to. Oh, man. I, I, uh, so good. And this is why despite everyone saying joker's been so overdone like i'm telling you it would be fine the batman part three let's just say he comes to full fruition by that point you do realize how far away jo uh, the batman part three is <laughs> part two if we're lucky still given the right strike and um actor strike 2025 october that's if it's not delayed part three dude i think we'll be ready for some more joker to be on the screen if you get what i'm saying it's years and years and years away uh, but anyway this part so good and this is, of course, the key to the whole scene, which is that he does think that they deserve it. That is Joker. That. That bit there, right at the end, when he's just like the blurry bit and you just see the shoulders there. You see the hands collected together and you see the bubble head. That is very Joker from comic book frames. Um, the the laugh here, I think, is a lot better than the one we actually got in the film. The one at the end of the film was, it was a bit slower. It was a bit hyena still, and I'm not against that. But here it's, uh, I think it's more maniacal in the, in the best kind of way. And I think that's because he got into the scene because he's literally love loving and laughing and lapping up how much he's... Um, just hit the spot right there with Batman. And it's not even just annoying him. It's, as I said, in the most true way. And again, imagine how gleeful and sadistically correct he is, but like, you know, bringing that out. But anyway, my main point here is um, the laugh and the like kind of bubble head and the shot they leave it off on is a panel straight out of a mother in comic book. Like, I love this. Like, look at it. this. 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 <laughs> That is a character who hasn't even been crowned or called himself the Joker yet. Can you imagine what the next two, three decades are like for our boy? 
Robert Pattinson's Batman. So I just wanted to do a reaction and a kind of breakdown and commentary of, you know, I'm sure the video is titled something like why I think, I, 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 this probably isn't the title, but right now why I think Matt Reeves' Joker is being slept on or why I think that the Joker is really great in the Batman's universe based, you know, on the conceptual level and the little nuggets that we've been given because don't get me mistaken here, it's like we, we still have had only a little bit of that character. Um, it's not like we've had a whole movie. But I, I still wanted to point out and how I felt like there was... Um, such a a a broad range of ingredients there and most importantly the most rarest and hard to somewhat execute ingredients to make that a recipe of success for other iterations but despite actually having those ingredients a lot of people i don't i don't think quite realize how much matt reeves nailed joker even though he gave us the most subtle presentation of that character in the movie and even though one of the main appearances and the longest appearance of the Joker character is in a deleted scene. Fair enough if you still just like, yeah, but despite all of that, it's not really the vision that is my favorite. I wish Joker was maybe portrayed more in a Mark Hamill, Batman the Animated Series kind of way. But I totally get that. I really do. But I think with my, I would say, broad appreciation for the character, I do still really take different iterations like this which i i call it different but i mean insanely accurate to the source material still and, and really innovative on the concept of what even made that character to get to the place of the accuracy of the source material but clearly like the design is a bit more horrific but as i said as well i'm really open to stuff like that to have this kind of um palette of appreciation for multiple different joker looks because you know you can get the batman the animated series one you can have the jerome valesca of gotham type jokers the killing joke ones and uh, but you can get the serious house on a serious earth joke you can get the new 52 joker early on who had his face cut off and then stapled it back on amongst very many other horrific close-up shots of uh of, of that guy. So I think I've rambled enough. I, I would just love to know what you think after having watched this video. Let me know if you've seen it before uh, and if that helped inform your appreciation for Matt Reeves' vision because I, I, even if you don't fully uh, land on the same page, it's, it, I think it's near impossible to deny how cool and how faithful the inspiration is and that and how that led him to the source material accuracies it's that's what the innovation is it's not deviation it innovates on the canon and still meets the canon right on the same road and they're both ready to rock it off together and let me know as well if this is the first time you've seen it and and what you think of it now has it maybe changed your perspective and can you get with it a bit more anyway that is me rambling and rambling and rambling hope you enjoyed the video if you want to see more videos like this let me know down in the comments below i'd really appreciate your support by hitting like on the video it helps me get out there in the algorithm consider subscribing for more the batman videos like this but other than that guys thank you so much for watching i hope you have a lovely rest of your day and i'll see you fellow bat family in the next video goodbye